So, so I'm working for Merck. So maybe a first disclaimer here. So we have two different Mercs, which are completely unrelated. So there is the, the, the what in the US is called Merck, Merck Sharp and Dome. Yeah, th those are uh, those guys. And we are the company Merck KGAA or Merck Group, um, which we have um, three different sectors. Yeah, and we, we are a science driven uh, company and uh, we have healthcare company, we have performance materials and we are also known as Millicore Sigma. So we distribute all the stuff you need in the lab. So that's us. And uh, in, this, in this, we have um, in our semiconductor branch, we have presented at the uh, CES Consumer Electronics Show 2020, we have identified neuromorphic technology as one of the ground, groundbreaking novel paradigms. And of course, many of people from the semiconductor are rather looking what you can do, uh, how you can improve uh, in-memory computing for image faster image recognition efficiency, et cetera. And I myself am stupid enough to be a troublemaker. <laughs> and uh, as a troublemaker, um, we are currently investigating how we can use neuromorphic technology for developing novel tools um, for the research community and also for the sake for the, for the benefits of patients. And in there currently we have three working hypotheses, so that's under discussion. So I'm, I'm just really under discussion. It's work in progress. So therefore, we we, we have an, our coming out and ask for feedback if it's nonsense or not, uh, or looking for also for partnerships. Um, so there is of course one thing which could be a different kind of biomarker. So the pharma industry is very much focused on wet biomarkers, so everything that is wet. Eventually, we have novel ideas. Uh, variables driven infrastructure using neuromorphic infrastructure to really monitor clinical outcomes that we hope to have from treatments. Yeah, this could be drug treatments, but it could also be therapy, other therapies. And also maybe interesting also for Parkinson and, and also for uh, multiple sclerosis that we have early identification of an onset of a hidden disease. So the earlier we get in specifically for MS, and we give one, one of the drugs that are available that, pro, that, that prolong the disease progression. So the earlier we stop the disaster going on, the higher is the disease, uh, um, the, the overall survival time. I mean, that's the ethical viewpoint of it. And um, currently there is not much <laughs> that we can do to, to, detect, to detect the onset of MS. I mean, we can do NMR, but we need to, to do this really, I mean, it's painful to do that or lumbar puncture, et cetera. So that's one thing. Uh, if we could neuromorphic infrastructure, what does this mean? We don't know yet, but definitely it might be it might be variables with in-memory computing, et cetera. So the, the, the next step would be maybe here jumping to the third one in, in, in sequence that we have neuromorphic prosthetics and implants, which is we have the, the ability to use spiking networks, uh, which record I don't know the, the signal from the lumbar spine or whatever in a normal person, and then if if my if if I get a fit or whatever, I can have an implant uh, that can intelligently, intelligently and autonomously adapt to this switch. I don't know Parkinson too much, but maybe we don't know. Um, and and have something like a complement, like a like a heart pacemaker something like a neuro pacemaker, if, if this makes sense. So this is another uh, direction we want to uh, investigate. And something which is close to my heart, and this is really far out, um, we have been discussing with uh, lots of people in the neuromorphic infrastructure here in Heidelberg. We have a very fantastic um, you know, uh, infrastructure called uh, brain scales. So they really build uh, with analog chip technology. They, they really build from the synapse up uh, up to the cortical network. Then we have uh, with, with Steve Ferber uh, in, uh, and, and his Spinnaker, we have another approach. They model, they start from the synapse and the functional synapse up to a uh, mouse brain. I think in, in Dresden, they, they are now working on the second generation of this. Uh, we have uh, lots of approaches. Um, and my idea is that we could, this is for, this, for, the, for debate, that we could have really multi-scales so that we work on the membrane level with ion channels to, to, to check drug interaction on the ion channel level and not do <clears throat> and, and then rebuild the whole nervous infrastructure based on the anatomy atlas that we have, for example, in eBrains. I mean, we have all this data uh, and bring this really together as an as a novel research instrument 
to do the following that first of all we test if our hypothesis works um, uh, if we say we know how ms works so let's just invent a drug that mimics the 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 disease progression or that mimics the inhibition of the disease progression and the, i think the challenge is that or, or the hope is that um, these things are more or less that i'm emulating the disease so this is not i'm simulating it but i'm really emulating it and the difference is that i'm just doing another thing so instead of having a human in carbon based <clears throat> i have an artificial human or organ or cell depending on the scale uh, in silico and it's just behaving as, as it, I mean, it, it's really behaving as is. And there come, of course, lots of problems. For example, if we look at fatigue, <laughs> I need to, first of all, train the baby and then grow it and then feed it and then check if it's fatigued. I think that might be not only an ethical problem, but also a technical problem. But the, the, the proposal, I think we, we should investigate as a whole community from neuro researchers, rehabilitation, uh, drug development, uh, performance materials guys, are we able to bring such a thing to life? Maybe just to avoid the typical case that I have an idea from a disease. I build my animal model. I build my knockout mouse. I put my soup on top of it. And then I go into human and I just see it doesn't work because the human is different. <laughs> it's not that I'm hitting out the knockout mouse, but, but I have a real human. And yeah, I mean, that's my hope. And <laughs> And I know that it's very far away. And uh, nevertheless, I think we, as intelligent community for neuroscience, future performance materials, just starting the discussion. If, if you from a research say, I, if I would have something that mimics the, I don't know, what L-type potassium channel, L-type calcium channel here with my something, eventually we could go together with uh, neuromorphic infrastructure developers and say, ah, we have this. We have this. We have this material. We have we, uh, intermolecular is a part of our of our um, yeah, ecosystem, <laughs> and uh, we really are chip developers. Yeah, so we know what to do. So it not alone, but uh, we, we we might have compounds that are interesting for others who then build something for you. So that, that's the network approach. And I think also looking at the time, this is where I stop. Um, presenting and really look forward for questions or, or, or destruction criteria and say this is fully nonsense, it doesn't work, or, or also just asking for help or further input. Thanks so much, Thomas. I've had a very similar but not thought through opinion like that about the neuromorphic architecture is that it, it I know, and I've only read periphery around it, but it does make sense to think of it as developing this from modeling these kind of diseases and being the bridge between animal models to uh, primate to uh, non-human primate so it makes sense to me and like as both you and uh Josefa said that that early period is so difficult to understand it's a period that we well i'm saying we i'm just gonna i'll talk about myself because maybe i'll be di disregarding that but a lot of people ignore the early like we all want to get to that stage but the reality is to see differences uh, between groups, you, you have to look at a late stage as opposed to an early stage where it's subtle and it's hard to see. And if you have models like mouse models or the neuromorphic architecture, you can actually do development and you can see many strands of changing something, see how things develop. So like, yeah. And also neuromorphic, like, I don't know how easy it is to work with, but I, I, it's not so hard, is it? Or how, how are they to work with? Like, huh. I, mean, I have a colleague. There are, of course, different tech, different technologies. So the, I, yeah. I have not programmed it yet myself, everything. <laughs> but, I mean, the, it's like a programming a computer. So the, the, there is yeah. the, of course, this main difference of spiking neural networks, which everybody thinks is interesting. So also from an energy efficiency. Um, so, so you you have you have equations, yeah, and then you you feed them uh, equations in a, in a so you can do neuromorphic modeling on a, in silico classical computer. So this is what things are running, at. and and of course you can mimic really the physical architecture of the synapses at least, and give them a functional memory. 
or you, you give them a function how they react to input channels and then you let it you, you build the network and i think that the real challenge is that most of the interesting things are unfortunately or fortunately emergent problems <laughs> even even if we understand them in theory and then we let them just run and not predict but we really let them run and then for sudden things we have life you know <laughs> or or the leeches uh, capture something and they build a whole new organism from emergent and we just don't know and this is my hope that we um that we could use um, these kinds of yeah, tools yeah, to, to emulate things and detect stuff we, we have not been able to, uh, to foresee and specifically putting patient safety first. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what, what we as a drug, uh, the drug company, part of our company is, is doing. Yeah, you have something and the best to the very best knowledge, you assume each and everything works fine. Then we let the thing run and we detect after 10 years, ooh, something happened. I mean, definitely, it's not only the drug and the neural, so it's also the environment influencing, but there is this feedback loop, which is, I guess, unfortunately, extremely complex to model, but at least we could identify the players and say, we have no data and we, we let it run and we see it doesn't fit. So there must be something on top and then we can identify novel, novel levels. And that complexity also comes with, for example, Parkinson's, um, it's not a single genetic disorder, it's a many different, and that, that makes it so hard because many different pathways gets to the same behavior, but there are very different routes and therefore modeling of those different routes is so important because for different people, uh, the turning point, and even within MS, for example, like different people are relapsing, remitting, remitting um, you know, a long time they don't have anything and then they, uh, and then the set in someone who has the same diagnosis is, you know, affected very aggressively early on and, you know, finding out what environmental or genetic differences or what things to look for is so important. So uh, now we'll go on to our final speaker of today.